Hi, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. Uh, with me, I've got uh, John Quill Lowe, and we're going to be talking about her latest book, which is The Good Retirement Guide 2023, 37th edition. Uh, John Quill, thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking about your book. Um, and just, just give us a, an overview of your background in terms of contributing to this book. Yeah, well, first I'd like to say it's a great pleasure to be here, Tim. So thank, thank you very you. much for having me on. Um, yeah, th this th th the book is in the 37th edition. Um, I can't claim credit for all of those, uh, I'm afraid. Though it started back in the 1980s um, with an author called uh, Rosemary Brown. And at the time, I was just cutting my teeth with my own first books about pensions and retirement, uh, which I was uh, writing for, for Witch, for Witch Books at the time. And uh, I was very much aware of the Good Retirement Guide as being one of our competitors and, and definitely a book to, to keep your eye on. And so I was really delighted when a few years uh, back now, um, Kogan Page approached me and said, would I be interested in taking over this title? And uh, yeah, I jumped at the chance because it's, uh, it, you know, it's got a really good pedigree. So, mm. yeah. I mean, I've, I've read it and it is a it's a fantastic book, um, you know. So what I wanted to and one of the things I wanted to do today was say, um, how do we take a subject which is very, very wide and actually narrow it down? So if there's anybody out in the out there in the audience that's got any particular questions. Um, but what I was going to do was set a sort of an exam question, which would say, I'm in my 50s. Um, you know, retirement's kind of uh, suddenly appeared on my journey, on, on, on my agenda. People are suddenly t talking about it. What should I do? Um, Tim, is, is so, this a personal query? Is this you? <laughs> it's it's a, 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 a very good friend of, of mine. <laughs> of course, a very good friend. Yeah, well, like you say, it's, it's, a, it's a big area. And retirement is one of those things that when we're younger, we don't really want to think about. And so I think it creeps up on us all kind of a bit suddenly. Um, you get to your mid-50s and retirement is no longer that that way distant thing it's something that's approaching quite fast and you might even have the opportunity to retire early you know which can be very tempting I, so, I, we've got we've got friends who retired at 55 mm. um partly because of um the organizations that they were in wanted to get rid of them well, sometimes that that's not that's not a bad way to go because um, very often organisations will then offer um, a, a, an enhanced pension. And a my, really my father package. was retired from the BBC. At, this is thirty years ago at fifty five mm -hmm. or fifty six, and they gave him an enhanced pension to go. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I mean, there are several things that you need to think about, though. Um, Firstly, is is you know is retirement for you? Because I think remember that work is not just about earning money; it's also a source of kind of companionship, self esteem, um, and so retirement is not necessarily for everybody. But on the other hand, perhaps stepping back and working part time or switching to another area of work, maybe starting your own business. Those are all things that sometimes people have as aspirations when the main job um, stops. But another important aspect, obviously, is have you got your finances in a row? Yep. And um, the essentially, you're looking at two sides of an equation. You're saying, on the one hand, how much income will I need in retirement? And on the other, how much uh, income have I got laid in through my pension planning? Uh, and um, so perhaps if we if we just start with the income side, there are lots of figures banded around. When I first started working in pensions, uh, the rule of thumb was you, you want a, an income that's two thirds of your income while you were working. And I, I actually don't think that rules like that are terribly helpful. Um, they often overestimate the amount of income you need. And while that might not seem such a bad thing in one respect, it can actually make the goal of retiring unattainable because you, you're trying to save more than is realistic. 
So uh, it's better to, to try and um, be a bit more tailored in, in your approach. Now, the, um, the PLSA, the um, Pensions and Lifetime Saving Association, um, a little while ago did a, an interesting piece of work where they tried to estimate the um, income that people would need for different types of retirement. Uh, so they looked at a kind of minimum retirement, a moderate and a comfortable. And um, for, the, um, for the minimum retirement, for a single person, they came up with a sum of £13,000 a year, which is actually quite attainable. When you think about it, the, the state pension... State um, pension is 10000 a year. Exactly. From next month, it's 10000 So you actually don't need very much more just to kind of get by. Um, if you want a more comfortable retirement, if you want what they call moderate, then you're talking more like uh, £23,000. So obviously, you know, a, a bit of a jump up. And then if you want a comfortable retirement, I think their figure was something like 37, which is really quite a lot. But even, even these figures are, are kind of like the ballpark figures. And some of... Um, some of this journey, uh, this financial journey of, of, of knowing whether you can survive in retirement is also about knowing yourself. I mean, you might be a very extravagant person. You might like to go on lots of holidays, in which case you're definitely going to err uh, towards that more comfortable level and needing quite a high income. But you might be quite a, a frugal person by nature. And, and you might even already have quite a good idea of what you could get by on because if you've got to a stage of life where perhaps your mortgage is paid off your children have left home then you're probably already um kind of living the, on the type of income that that you might want in retirement but you could you, you start off in the book with you talk about budgeting that's right. And getting the bu your your budget right, and then you go on in the next chapter and you talk about pensions and 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 just getting that right for you. Yep, yep. That well, that's right. So you know, if you've got that ballpark, you can refine it even more if you like by going through a budgeting exercise. So you can look at what you spend now, and um, have a sort of thought experiment about the changes that work will bring which might be, for example, no longer commuting into work, maybe you won't need two cars, you know, all those kind of things that might, might change your, your spending in retirement. Then you need to flip, yes, and look at the other side of the equation. And we've talked about the state pension. Um, so um, assuming that you qualify for the full state pension, which a lot of people do these days, um, you, you, you you need uh, 35 years worth of national insurance um, and, and if you go on to credits. and if you go on to the HR, HMRC website um, you can check that out can't you you can check that out even better you can ask for a state pension statement which will give right. you an estimate of what your state pension will be so that's that's fairly easy to check out hmm. then you might have pensions uh, from your current employer past employer uh, you might have pensions that you've built up yourself, particularly during periods of um, uh, self-employment. So what you want to do with those is get, get a statement. Um, most of them you'll have a statement once a year anyway. Yeah. So that might be enough for you to start to get a handle on what your, your pensions might be. And I think a really important aspect to look at is how those pensions will increase with inflation. Um, you know, this current cost of living crisis has made us all a lot more aware. Though I have to say, you know, when I started work, it was back in the 70s and inflation peaked then, it was 27% uh, a year was, was the peak. I remember when the mortgage rate was on my first house, it was 15%. Yeah, well, exactly so. So, so, so some of us have got that memory locked in about, about inflation. But, you know, even, even a low rate of inflation eats into your money over time. So even if we go back to 2% a year inflation, if that continues for 25 years, then, then a, a hundred pounds you have today would only buy the same as 61 pounds. Um, well, our council practice has gone up 10% this year. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, in, you know, if inflation is higher than 2%, then obviously your buying power is being eroded much more quickly. So it's really important to look at how those pensions will keep pace with inflation. And what you'll find is the the state pension is more or less index linked. Um, it, it's a bit more complicated th than that, but 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 let, let, let's just uh, leave it at that for now. So so that's going to retain its buying power. Um then if you look at uh, pensions from an employer, they are quite likely to increase in line with inflation, but up to a maximum level. Now, that's often 5% a year. Sometimes it's 3% a year. So in you know what we might call kind of like normal times, that might be enough. But obviously, it's, it's lagging behind um, inflation in a period like we're in at the moment. And then when you look at those pensions that you build up for yourself, um, personal pensions, now usually it's up to you to decide how you turn the kind of savings pot that you build up into an, a retirement income. And you can choose, broadly speaking, whether or not to build in some inflation proofing or, or not. And um, if, if, you, if you don't, then it would be really sensible to think about setting aside some savings from your retirement income so that later on you can draw on those savings if the buying power of your pensions has gone down. That's great advice. Great advice. Um, so in terms of moving on from pensions, what, what are you what, what's someone going to do when they um, uh, when they retire? Yeah, well, obviously, that's that's a very uh, personal choice. Um, but um, a lot of people, you know, as we touched on earlier, they're not um, necessarily ready to, to stop completely. And um, certainly, you know, if you've had that long held ambition to start your own business, this could be a really great time to do it because with most pension schemes, um, you have the option to take uh, part of your your savings as a tax free lump sum, right. so that you know that might be really useful if you want to start a business and need a little bit of capital to get going. Um, you might you might be interested uh, though, uh, not in self employment because I mean self employment is not for the faint hearted. No, um, no, as, far as you know, <laughs> my, my parents ended up volunteering, so um, my mother's eighty five and she still works in in a box office of a, of a, a theater oh that sounds lovely yeah that sounds really fun or you know i've always thought it'd be quite fun as well being one of those people in in a national trust house yes you know? yes she she said that she all she would only do that if she dressed up if she was oh, to dress right. up. <laughs> very nice yes so, uh, uh, to, to, toya is one of my mother's customers Oh, if fantastic. You, I don't know if you ever remembered Toy. Oh, yes, yes, indeed, I do. Yes, yes. No, so that's great. So there's this kind of trio. There's there's self-employment, there's becoming an employee, maybe doing a job that you're, you're uh, kind of more interested in, um, but still earning a bit of money, or indeed, you know, volunteering, as you say. And there is such um, a wealth of, of areas that you can go into, um, you know, that it... it, it if you like helping people, um, then there are also all kinds of opportunities for supporting um, people who are elderly or disabled, befriending, um, doing shopping, all those kind of things. Um, if you're if you have a financial bent, you know, you might think about volunteering with um, citizens advice and perhaps giving advice, death yeah, advice that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you've already mentioned there's the, you know, the arts. Um, and historical societies. Um, the list really is is absolutely endless. And I, I think what you choose depends very much on your own particular makeup. You know, do you like working with people? Um, or maybe you're a figures person. You, you know, charities are always looking for people to be the treasurer. Nobody ever wants yes. that job, you know. So so I, I think volunteering, there is definitely something out there for everyone. And um, you can you can either contact charities direct um, or um, quite often, you know, if, if, if you live in a town, um, 
you'll find that there's uh, the, the local authority may be able to advise you on volunteering opportunities, the local library. Um, there, there may be um, a local organizer. I know in our high street, we actually have a sort of volunteering shop that you oh. can go into, you know, and say, I'm interested in volunteering this area. What, what, what are the options? Um, so, yeah, all kinds of opportunities there. So and the next subject is one about children and grandchildren, mm. um, because if we, we've worked out what we want in terms of our own pension and our own spending, um, you know, the, the, the bank of mum and dad is something that um, is is um, or even the, the bank of um, um, nanny and grandpa or whatever, granny and grandpa or whatever it is, is something that seems to be, you know, uh, more and more popular. I mean, ha I mean, we can never budget for these things, but I guess we need to start thinking about this as part of our budgeting process. Yes, I, I think one of one of the really strong um, messages that comes out of planning your retirement financially is that you may actually realise that you don't necessarily need all of the money that you have set aside, right? And so it might be possible. Perhaps instead of leaving your children to to wait, you know, until some future day when they, they inherit from you, um, you might actually be able to kind of give them a living inheritance, give them some money now mm -hmm. that could be really helpful, you know, especially as, um, you know, kids in their 30s, 40s, many of them, you know, still can't afford to get on the housing ladder. And the, as you say, the bank of mum and dad maybe the the way to unlock that opportunity for children or indeed grandchildren um you know really important aspect though is is don't give away money that you really can't afford to yes um and when it's when it comes to making sort of big gifts um like this um then you want to sort of keep a little a bit of an eye on inheritance tax what you give um, is most likely going to um, count as a potentially exempt transfer, which means that it's free of inheritance tax, provided you uh, survive for seven years seven after years. making the gift. So, you know, it's something to, to perhaps think of um, in, in your earlier phase of retirement. And that is that, and is that down the, the same for any other assets that may get passed on? Um, well, there are there are quite a lot of other ways to give lifetime gifts that are free of inheritance tax, um, but in general, the amounts you can give are, are smaller than than say the deposit for for a house. Mm. So, um, for example, you can give uh, three thousand pounds a year. Um, free of inheritance tax. Uh, and if you don't use that allowance in one year, you can roll it over to the next year, um, but only for one year. Uh, so, so you know, you could give up to £6,000 in one year and then it reverts back to the £3,000. Um, you can also make uh, gifts on the occasion of marriage. Right. So if you're a parent, you can give um, up to £5,000 to the, the, the couple. Um, so that's for each parent. So, um, you know, that, that, that could be £10,000 if you, if you have a partner. Uh, for grandparents, the limit is £2,500. Right. Uh, and anyone else, it's £1,000. And then there's a rather curious um, exemption. You can, you can give any amount uh, without an upper cap as long as it forms uh, a pattern of regular giving that doesn't reduce your own standard of living. Okay. Uh, and that could be quite useful, um, for example, if you wanted to perhaps pay into a pension scheme mm. for your child or grandchild. Mm. Um, it can also be used for schemes that usually involve life insurance and trusts where you can sort of accumulate some money outside your estate that can benefit someone else. I'm being slightly cautious about these schemes because they HMRC is very hot these days on tax avoidance and you have to be very careful that any scheme that you go into like that actually is a bona fide scheme and will not be attacked by the revenue. 
we've seen many um, instances of um, tax avoidance schemes that then weren't tax avoidance schemes because yeah. there's been, been some quite high profile people like David Beckham and that being uh, caught in them, haven't they? Absolutely. And I, I think I think the golden rule really is don't enter into anything that's so complex you can't understand it. Mm. You know, play it safe. John Quill, thank you so much for coming on and talking about your book, uh, The Good Retirement Guide 2023. Um, I've read it and it it's a it's a it, it, it covers everything you need, really. I mean it it, it is such a wide subject area. Um and there's um and we, we haven't didn't have time to talk about it, but it, there's about setting up your own business, which, which I quite agree with you that it's not for the faint hearted because I've done it myself. Uh, and also talking about leisure activities, retiring abroad, um, what to do about your home, uh, investments. I mean, tax. I mean, it covers just about everything that you need to, to, to cover about um Retirement. Well, it can't it can't cover it all in depth, but but we do support it with a really detailed directory that signposts you to other places to get further information. Uh, and 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 Andrew, who who often listens in, uh, says that Jimmy Carr likes a tax avoidance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I believe he does. Yes. Anyway, um, the Good Retirement Guide um, uh, from our friends at Kogan Page. Thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to us. Remind well, thank me- you, Tim. Remind people where they can find you. Um, yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I'm, I also work at the Open University, so you can find me there on their website too. You are on their website because I've found I you am. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th- thank you so much for coming in and talking about this and, um, and, 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 and sharing your expertise. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me, Tim. You're welcome. Thank you.